I hope you all had um, a good lunch, and I hope no one here ate a bar, so that you don't sleep on us. If you sleep, the Holy Spirit will wake you up. <laughs> it's good to be back this uh, afternoon or evening, whichever one you fall. And um, it's good also to hear the church sing. It's always a wonderful thing. Uh, just recently, I was at the Reformed Baptist Network General Assembly, and the people sang. And if there's anything I took out of that assembly was the fact that we all sang, and it was just a joyful thing. It was just full. Everyone was just full of joy singing the songs to God. Because we know that I'm not singing for my pastor or anyone around me. It is a praise to our God. And so it's, again, it's always a joyful thing hearing the people sing songs of praise to our God. And that's why we're in the book of Psalms, a book of praise to our God. Let us pray. Gracious Father, loving King, creator of all earth, the one who was and is and is to come, the everlasting one, we come before you today, we undeserving people, we whom you have shown so much great love to that we just can wrap our minds around the fact that a great God like you would condescend down to save wretched, wicked people like us. Who are we that you are mindful of? You didn't only save us. You put your words in our mouth to sing songs of praise back to you. Lord, this is humbling. And we thank you for this morning as we, we, we looked at Psalm 1. And now we come to the book, the second chapter of this book. And Lord, may our hearts, Lord God, be filled with joy. May we Leave here singing praise to your name. May our understanding be filled. May we know you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning we, we looked briefly at Psalm 1 and we saw how the wisdom of God was displayed in Psalm 1 and the wisdom in which God triumphed through the his word. We saw the the value of the, va- the value that the righteous place on things, and the value that the wicked place on things. We saw the two lights being contrasted: the righteous man and the wicked man. And we saw that the righteous man is the one that delights in the law of the Lord. You know that word "delight" is a very strong word. Delight means full of joy. You is always longing for something and we see that it wasn't that we longed for God but rather God first longed for us even in our worst estate and now we can now long for God because he had longed for us and we also saw the outcome there's only two sides is that you're on the Lord's side or you're not and we say as believers for those of us who are on God's side that we should be encouraged and that we should persevere and delight in his law that only through that are we able to triumph now we come to Psalm 2 and Psalm 2 also follows the same interpretative process with Psalm 1. Psalm 2 is also a poetry like Psalm 1 and it's is divided into four stanzas. Verse 1 to 3 is one stanza. Verse 4 to 6 is another stanza. 
verse 7 to 9 is another stanza. Then verse 10 to 12 is another stanza. So that's how we're going to look at it briefly today. Uh, I hope I'll be able to finish that quickly. And turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Psalm 2 begins with a question. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us bust their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Verse 7. I will tell of a decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now David sings now of how the nations and rulers and the people of earth assemble themselves and they are plotting and taking counsel against the Lord. Now in Psalm 1, we saw how, we saw the display of God's wisdom. We saw that God in his wisdom has empowered his people by giving them the law. And so we we triumph, we are victorious by God's law. Now we're not seeing the response of the people of the earth. It said, David says that these nations, these rulers, they take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. And the word anointed there is, which is being translated also to mean Christ. Now why are they doing this? Because David said this song with a question. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain because it does not make sense why are they doing this why would they plot against the king of kings simply because the seat of David must not be enthroned the king must not be enthroned the nations are plotting because they do not want the king, the true king, to be enthroned. The enemy, the devil, does not want God's promise of the Messiah to come to pass. So they rage and plot to destroy the seed of David. You read this and wonder what is going on here. Has this ever happened before or when will it happen? Here David is singing a prophetic praise and a royal song to the king that is above all kings. The apostles helps us to understand this, what was going on here, and how to apply it. We see that in Acts 4, after Peter and John were treated and released by the council, and they went and reported to the others, and when they heard the, other, the report, the Bible said, look at what happened. In Acts 4, verse 20 to 30, 24 to 30, Peter and John just were released. They were tortured and released. And they went back to the rest of the people and reported what happened to them. What happened? The Bible said when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, 
along with the Gentiles and the peoples of, of, of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their heart, their threats, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of our Lord, of, the, of your holy servant Jesus. What is going on here? The apostles, when Peter and John were released, and they went back to the people, and the people prayed. In prayer, they were quoting Psalm 2. And saying, Lord, you said through your servant David, our father, by the Holy Spirit, that why did the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? He said, truly in this city they did it. So what is the apostle saying? What, they, what is going on here? They are helping us understand that what David was singing in Psalm 2 was a prophetic song of what? The Messiah. David was singing about the Messiah. Now, did this happen literally? It happened historically in David's, in David's time. But when David was singing that song, David was singing of the Messiah that the nations are plotting against. They came together. So the apostles helped us understand that this Psalm 2 was a Psalm that is pointing towards the Messiah. The nations are plotting against the king that will be enthroned, the son of David. So, how do we understand this? We should understand this in the light of this prayer that the disciples prayed. That the kings of this earth, the rulers of this earth, came together against the Lord Jesus. The rulers of this earth, along with Herod and Pontius Pilate, they came together, with, together even with the people of Israel, to crucify Jesus. But at the same time, the apostle said, they did it, what they did, he said, to do whatever your hand and your plan are predestined to take place. So what was going on? The people of the earth were raging against God and his anointed. And they thought they were doing something spectacular, something good. But what they didn't, they didn't know is that what they were planning and what they were taking counsel to do was actually to bring to pass what the Lord has predestined. And what does that mean for the children of Israel singing this song? It means hope. It means encouragement. That they know that though they ever, they, they are to rage against the people of Israel, but the Lord will conquer. Two-edged sword here. One is a fulfillment in Jesus, but the other also is an application to the persecution of the church. In Acts 4, the church was being persecuted. And when the church was being persecuted, they sang that song as a prayer to God. So the church was saying at that time that what we are going through at this moment is the same thing that they plotted against our Messiah. So how should we on this side of history see this? The persecution of the church is not new. The persecution of the church is not unique to us. The persecution of the church is not something we should go crazy about. We should be encouraged that the same counsel that they are taking right now, they took that same counsel against our Messiah. What was the outcome? The disciples, in praying this prayer, they said, Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They did not ask the Lord to call down fire and burn the Islamic Jihad people. They asked the Lord for the same thing that the man, a godly man in Psalm 1 we saw in this morning did. They asked the Lord that what? 
that we speak your word with blood, with boldness. It's all about God's word. The man who delights in God's law, in time of persecution, he will pray for boldness to continue to speak that word. The church will be persecuted. The church will continue to face persecution till Christ come. But this is what we should pray for. The Lord continue. Give us that strength. Grant us that we will continue to speak your word with all boldness in the face of persecution. The church in Nigeria will face persecution and we will be facing persecution and will continue to face persecution. But be encouraged that though the nations will rage or are raging right now, they are plotting different plots and different things. They are taking counsel in secret places just as they did for the Messiah, for Jesus. But know this, it is just as it was according to God's plan, it is the same today. And our prayer is that the Lord will grant unto his people the boldness to continue to speak God's word. And he said, why you stretch your hand? Now it is not us. Grant us boldness to speak your word. Then why you, Lord, you stretch your hand and do your own thing, Lord. That's it. Their disciples were not praying that, Lord, we want to have the power to begin to heal and make and, and do signs I want. I said, what we want, Lord, is just give us that boldness to continue to speak your word in the face of persecution. So, brothers and sisters, as Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3, is fulfilled in Jesus, we can see the application to a persecuted church the way the disciples applied it here. They applied it to themselves. They were being threatened. They were being persecuted. And so in the face of persecution, what should we pray for? Boldness to continue to speak God's word. Now, how did heaven respond to the rage? We see that in verse 4 to 6, the response of heaven to the rage. What was heaven's response to the rage? He said, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, the one who sits in heaven, the king of kings, laughs. He mocks them and says to them, you must be kidding. I mean, you must be kidding. That you are setting yourself against the king of kings. You must be kidding. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is a firm and established thing. There's nothing you can do about it. Before the foundation of the world, I have what set my king on Zion. This is sure. This is sealed. My word will not return to me empty. It will accomplish that which I have proposed and succeed in which I have sent it. My king, the anointed one, the Christ, the seed of David, will reign over his people. And that's what heaven responded to these foolish ones. Brothers and sisters, what a comfort that should stir up in us. It should stir us in up, in up, up, it should stir us in up, stir us up to celebrate our king. Though the government of nations, though the powers that be in different nations will, will cook up things and will rage against Christ's church, our king is reigning over all. And in the face of great opposition and plot, David is singing the praise of the king of kings. So we should do the same thing in the face of opposition. Knowing that the Lord, the king of kings, has established all things. It's like a man, a mighty man standing and told his son, stand there. And the enemy is in front of his son. And the man says, you stand there. I'm right, be- I'm right behind you. But that's man. But God had laid the foundation of everything. Had done everything before he even laid the foundation of the world. 
And I think we need to understand something clear here, and which is that the Bible said that he who sits in the heavens laughs. He said, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. When did this happen? This happened even before the foundation of the earth was laid. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, it is God's plan that his son will reign, will be the Messiah. It is God's plan that he will bring his people into his kingdom. So when the, ever, when the people were, when the nations were raging, all that God did was just what? Laugh. Why? Acts 4. He said there, remember what he said in Acts 4? To do, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan are predestined to take place. So that's why heaven laughed. You know why? Because these have been predestined. There is a sure outcome. There is a sure end. And the Lord is in control. He is sovereign over all things. And he will bring to pass everything that he has predestined. Now we now see the anointed one himself was now introduced. The anointed one now came into the scene. Christ Jesus speaks in his third in the in 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 second in the third stanza, verse seven to nine. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, "You are my son. Today I have begotten you." Acts of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of edge your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I want to pause here. The first time I first heard this psalm quoted, the person was quoting it as his own. And this, I was a young Christian then. Acts of me and I'll make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. I have that voice, right? You shall break them in with a rod of iron. Let us not lose sight of the fact that this is David here singing to the Lord. But he's singing the words of Christ to God. In David's praise to God are the words of Christ speaking of his enthronement as the son. That's why if you look at verse 7, the word son there was what? In capital letter. That's not David. That's Christ. And he's speaking of Christ's enthronement and the assurance that the Father is with his Son and he will give the earth as a possession and he will rule over all. For the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. This is not about you and I. It's about the Son. Isn't that amazing? The kings and rulers of this earth they plot to destroy God's people and heaven laughs and uses the same earthly kingship, the line of David, to show that God Almighty is the King of Kings. Look at what the Lord God did. The same kingship, earthly kingship, that these rulers, these kings are plotting against. God used the same kingship to what? Show them that he's the King of Kings. So the son will be enthroned. The kingdom will be the sons. And the Lord accomplish it. Now let's, as if let's, we're walking back and we're standing here. Let's pretend that this is the children of Israel singing this song. And David leading them in this royal song. And they were all in the temple of God singing this song. What was going on in their mind there? That I will tell you of the decree. The Lord said to said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. What was going on in their mind there? What was going on in their mind is the same thing the disciple asked Jesus. 
Where is that kingdom? What was going on in their mind is that they were looking forward. That psalm was pointing them forward. They're looking forward to that Messiah. They're looking forward to that king who will be eternal, who will no longer die. Because David came and David will die. All the ones before David had come, they died. Everyone after David died. They were looking forward to that one. Brothers, sisters, are we looking forward? When we sing hymns of song of our Messiah, do we just sing that song for now or are we looking forward? Are you looking forward to the coming of your king? Are you looking forward to that final, final time where we will all stand before our king and we just rejoice before him? Are you looking forward to that? Are you looking forward to that time when this tent will be shed off? And all that we'll do will be before our Lord and Maker and we'll bow to the King of Kings, the one who laughed at the kings of the earth. Are we looking in anticipation that one day he will return and the kingdom of this world will be the kingdom of our King? Is there that stirring of that desire in us to celebrate him and look forward to that coming? Yeah, I know there's a lot to do on earth. But at the same time, we should look forward to that coming. This psalm helps us to look forward, to remind us that yes, Christ had come, and he is coming again. And he will come. And you know why we know he will come? Because the Lord already planned it before the foundation of the world. And finally, in our last stanza, David in his song gave his own two cobbles advice to the kings and the nations of the earth. Two cobbles is not, no longer money now. So David in his own advice gave them two million, uh, two million sent advice or two million naira advice. And he said to the, look at what David told them. He said, kings, please come. Let me advise you. It seems you guys, you don't understand what you are doing. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. Reach and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. David said, O kings of the earth, come, be wise, be warned. Now, he didn't say, O rulers of the earth, he said, serve the Lord with fear and, re and rejoice with trembling. But he now told them to do a single act. First, he said, serve the Lord. He didn't say, serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So the service, serving the Lord, he said, is not just serving the Lord. It comes, it should come with fear. Why? Because you are approaching the kings of all creation. Brothers, when we come before the Lord, our service in church should be done out of reverence for God, not because your pastor told you to do it. Yes, we should obey our leaders and authority, but ultimately, our service should come out of what? Reverence for Lord. And our rejoicing should come, he said, with what? With trembling. Now, that trembling is not a trembling of the fact that you do not know the Lord. For us as believers, we tremble at the glory, at the power, at the wisdom of our God. That trembling is that someone like me who did not deserve God's presence. God did not only save us. He did not only choose you. He adopted us as son. We can now come before him. Isaiah, Isaiah saw the vision of God. He fell flat. He was, he trembled. I know some pastors are not afraid. They are powerful. 
that they saw Jesus sit by them on the table and they are, they are eating. I'm not sure it's the same God I read in my Bible. Brothers and sisters, let us come before the Lord with rejoicing and with trembling because he's the King of Kings. Church, we are the people of God. We are the church of God. Let your service, let your worship be out of what fear and trembling before the Lord. Because your worship is to the king of all creation. Now, David did not tell the nations and the kings to go to God. He said, kiss the son. Which son is he referring to? The same son whom the father has given the nations as a heritage. He said, kiss the son. Why? Only through the son can you come into the kingdom. Only through the son can the father's wrath turn away from you. He said, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in your way. The Lord will be angry with you if you don't kiss the son. Then he told the nation, said, the Lord God, the king of kings will be angry. His wrath will remain on you if you don't kiss the son. There are only two sides. The side of those who have kissed the son and those who have refused to kiss the son. Those who have kissed the son will take refuge in him. And those who refuse to kiss the son, the wrath of God will be against them. What does it mean to kiss the son? It's to bow and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and the only Savior. It's the only name through which anyone can be saved. It's the only name he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Are you here? And you do not know the Lord. This is what the Bible says. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Listen, be angry. I invite you today to kiss the Son. I invite you today to bow before the King of Kings. I invite you and I implore you today. Least you perish in your way. Kiss the son. There's only, it's only in the son that you have salvation. The kings of this world will perish in their ways. The wrath of God is against them. The only way out is to kiss the son. Our worship, our praise, will make no sense if it's not done in the Son, if it's not done in Christ. The psalm, this psalm, Psalm 1 begins with, Blessed is the man. Psalm 2 ended with, Blessed are all. Look at that. Blessed is the man, or blessed are all who take refuge in him. What an assurance of salvation. What a confidence in the Lord our God. What a trust in God. David was so confident. He began by saying, blessed is the man. And he ended Psalm 2 by saying, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Church, let us sing to the glory of God, the king of all creation, who had ordained that his son will bring us into the kingdom. We do not deserve anything. We do not deserve a tiny drop of God's mercy. But God condescended. Our own king condescended. The kings of this world have their servants die for them. But our own king condescended and died. That he will rescue, rescue, that he will, that he may rescue Lord, a people to himself. A people who do not want to be rescued. And he now looked at his people. And the Lord blessed them. So the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 and 2. Gives us a summary of what the book of Psalms is about. It's about the king of all creation. Celebrating that king. And.
putting your trust in that king. All of the Psalms that David sang, you see that he's all about confidence in the Lord, trust in the Lord, his assurance. He knows that God will never fail. And this is a good thing for you to see. A reassurance of the salvation of God. That the Lord saved you and he will press you, he will keep you to the very end. Nothing, nothing in his hand will he lose. Glory be to God. Blessing and honor be to his holy name. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, what a comfort it is, Lord. The nations will rage. The kings will plot. But all of this, Lord, it's in vain. It's in vain not because we know what to do. We know the words to say. Not because we're skillful in our ways. Not because, Lord God, we have everything figured out. It's in vain because, Lord, you are in control of all things. You are sovereign of all. And Lord, this is what we ask, Lord. That you grant unto us to continue to speak your word with all boldness. To sing your word with all boldness. To celebrate our King day in and day out, Lord. To meditate on your law. Lord, help us to put our trust and confidence in you. And we pray, Lord God, for as many here or out there, Lord, who do not know you, we ask that, Lord, that they will turn from their wicked ways. And at the hearing of the gospel, Lord, that they will kiss the Son and I will take refuge in you. May your name be praised, Lord, forever and ever. Amen.